Hello, good evening, and welcome to the Majority Show. It's Wednesday, every every Wednesday of every week. We are here uh, with Scotland's number one anti-nationalist chat, uh, going out live on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. Um, I'm here tonight with the co-hosts Craig Houston and Mary Devlin. Uh, what will you be talking about tonight, Mary? Well, tonight I'm going to be discussing some of the media headlines from this week. And Craig, what are you going to be talking about? I'm going to be talking about an interesting fact that I didn't know uh, about the ministerial code after a okay, complaint good. I made to the ethical standards. Right. Oh, very good. And we'll all be talking about uh, the hate crime bill and the suspension of a Labour candidate over liking tweets. And of course, we have Zoomer of the Week. Right. So we'll be back with all that and much more in just a few seconds. We'll see you soon. Right, welcome back to the Majority Show, Scotland's number one politics and chat. And uh, our aim is a better Scotland uh, without the toxic nationalism that is strangling Scotland's potential. Here tonight with Mary, uh, who of course you all know, and uh, Craig Houston, who has stepped up to co-host uh, the show tonight. Sadly, Mark Zegfeld, our regular contributor, um, who was planned to be on the show today, has taken ill and given doctor's orders to rest. So we hope that he has a speedy recovery. I'm sure he'll be watching tonight and not get too outraged. Keep your heart rate down. <laughs> There, Mark. Um, okay, some of you will know Craig, though, from his Craig's Talks To podcast, uh, which is very popular on YouTube. So, Craig, give you, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're up to. Uh, I started the, the channel uh, as a hobby to interview guests, and the first few were ex Rangers directors, ex Rangers players, etc., just through my, my own contacts. But it's widened recently to I've had Top Key C on, a child abuse victim. Um, ex-royal bodyguard and then I also started my 10 minute moans which tend to be me directing my frustrations <laughs> to one towards Hamza Yusuf, the SMP and, and their cult You can keep the, all your moans into just 10 minutes <laughs> seems, Well, I'm going to be a little time. bit longer a time. Time <laughs> <laughs> Right, okay so we encourage everyone to uh, all our viewers to go over and have a look at uh, Craig's channel and listen to his 10 minute moans are very entertaining uh, anyway, uh, so please do that. It's, it's Craig's to Actually, you know what? We'll put a link in the description. That'll be a lot easier. Or a link up here, wherever it goes. I keep saying I'm going to do those, but um, this time <laughs> we'll put one in. All right. Okay, uh, Mary. I am doing the comments here. No, you're not. No, um, you? Yeah, but I'm going to take a little minute just to say that, sadly, Councillor Thomas Kerr has had a family emergency that happened just today, so he won't be able to make it tonight either. Uh, we wish his family member well, and we hope to have Thomas on the show next week. However, we will still have a chat about the state of Glasgow with Craig. Oh, actually, we we're going to do that. I'm not, I don't think we're going to do that anymore. Uh, do you think we should? I think we should just keep it for next week. Yes, I think we'll just keep keep that back for next for week. Thomas, the Glasgow yeah. Fat Cats was part of that. Of course, many of you will um, have seen that news in the paper. As always, a huge thanks to our friends at UK Union Voice and United Against Separation Facebook pages, where many of you are watching tonight. Um, and remember, sharing is caring. The number one thing you can do to is to like this show on YouTube. And even if you don't subscribe, please drop a like. And if you can subscribe, then please do so and increase our reach at the click of a button. Right. And also, now is the ideal time to get yourself a majority mug or a bullish holiday T-shirt. Although this is a majority T-shirt. Um, so anyway, they're flying off the shelves. Please uh, go to our uh, um, uh, webpage and we have a shop in there. You can get all kinds of things. Annoy your enemies and delight your friends. Of course. And of course, tonight I'll be managing the deluge of comments. So please keep them short and snappy and I'll try to put as many up on screen as I can. Right, okay, let's get into it then. Okay, the hate crime disaster, Hamza's hate crime disaster continues. Uh, according to figures released today, Police Scotland has re received 7,152 reports in one week, but only 240 of them are being looked at as actual hate crimes. The, vaja va vaja the vast the majority, yes, exactly. <laughs> the vast majority of complaints have been anonymous. If you remember, though, that last year there were about 5,000 
hate crimes reported last year, which uh, using my uh, intense uh, brain calculation God help is us. about 100 a week. So a quick calculation shows that Scotland is twice as hateful as it was last year. Uh, Craig, have you committed any hate crimes lately? Um, I'm prepared to guess not, based on three <laughs> facts. Um, I tend not to promote hate. I've been down south since uh, Saturday through to Monday, so I didn't put out much material. And due to me being down south, I didn't go to Ibrox for the game at the weekend. So um, I'm guessing I'm not. I guess I'm all right. Well, actually, I did see the thing there that the police said that uh, only two hate crimes were reported um, at the Celtic Glasgow, uh, Celtic Rangers match at the weekend, which seems a little bit yeah, maybe, do you think there were many more actually committed there? I'd be, I, I committed? Well, that, that's a different <laughs> topic. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say no comment because I'm no a grass. But um, <laughs> I'm surprised the lack of complaints. I thought it would have been a, a field day for... Uh, those who weren't allowed into the game, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm bemused how there was only two. Well. Yeah, it does seem. I mean, I, we don't. One of the things about this show is that we don't really follow the football at all. And David, of course, is a big uh, uh, fan, and of course, you're, you're right, I, I know. So, um, uh, but nonetheless, there are quite a lot of. You would expect to be quite a lot of hate incidents. They are 50,000 reported or some such thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, what we've got um, now, the question remains as to whether these hate crime in in incidents were logged by the police as non hate crime incidents. Now, we had a whole discussion about this over the past few weeks about why are the police recording things that are not actually crimes. And uh, now, Murder Fraser, the um, S, uh, MSP for Stirling, has criticised uh, the Scottish police because his he was reported, actually not under this legislation, but under the previous legislation, um, and he said that uh, he was recorded by someone uh, for committing a, a hate crime by saying that choosing to identify as non-binary is as valid as choosing to identify as a cat. Now... <laughs> We had this <laughs> discussion yeah. about yes about whether cats would be offended by that or not um, the other day. But nonetheless, he has threatened legal action and has now written to the Scottish Police Authority asking, how do we get answers from the police, not just for me, but for thousands of others affected? If as an, S if, as an MSP I put these questions to Scottish ministers, I am told that these are operational matters for the police, but they won't answer my or journalists' questions. Can we really have a police force that has zero accountability? And this is in context as well of the hate crimes that we reported on last week uh, that were recorded against uh, J.K. Rowling and Hamza Yousaf, where the police said that the, the, the incidents were neither crimes nor were they non-crimes. In fact, so basically, Murdo is there stuck in limbo, trying to work out: is he is he a criminal or not a criminal, or a, is he no, a non-criminal? Non yeah. Right, that's the thing. Is there a two-tier uh, justice system? You think working here, Craig? Certainly looks that way. I can't see how Murdo Fraser and others that I know uh, have been placed on a non-crime hate list. Yet two of the most complained about individuals have not been placed in any register, which I believe is actually the proper outcome for anyone who's not actually guilty of any crime. Mm -hmm, of course. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, this th whole thing, I mean, do you think it's a kind of like, a, we talked about this last week, Craig, it's like a police, police state. Is it Hamza's making a police state, do you think? My own personal opinion is that I think, yes, I think that's what he's trying to do, but the reaction by the police will dictate if it's actually successful or not. And I kind right. of have faith in the common sense and logic being applied by the police force just now. Oh, I'm not sure, sure about that one. <laughs> okay, I mean, I'm not not not, not, put, moment. Putting, not putting down the police or anything like that, yeah. but we've seen, like, for example, um, exa examples of policing, I mean, in all countries, all places of uh, over-aggressive policing and um, police, police picking on particular people, topics and so on, while ignoring other things as well. Mm. I think that's kind of the point here. They're kind of why are they why are they still investigating? Well, why are they not even saying anything about Murdo while they they have clearly said something about J.K. Rowling and uh, and Hamza? It seems yeah, it seems yeah. I, I just as I said earlier, I just think it's bizarre that Hamza and J.K. Rowling are not on the same list as a friend of mine and 
Murdo Fraser. That to me is bizarre. Right. Um, right. And I think if I think that I certainly I don't disagree with the comment that Hamza is trying to make. As please state here, but I can see some pushback, particularly from the police union, the police federation. I've been saying a lot of um, contradictory things to uh, to journalists, etc., when they've been been interviewed. So I, I can see, I can, yes, I, I think that's an intention, but I can see a wee bit of pushback from those who would need to make it a police step. Well, the police haven't really said that much. They've, all they've really said so far is, right, okay, we're putting more officers on it, and we're a bit annoyed about that. But I mean. Yeah. It's not really a big thing, is it? I mean, in that sense, it's it's not. You're not going to come. come I mean, the police federation kind of said a few things before, yeah. but they're not really, they're not really on it, are they? That's, I feel, I feel a little bit. You know, it's up, are we, we shouldn't really need the police to protect us from the government now. When we think, that, you know, but perhaps that is the case. I mean, actually, I didn't actually know this, but prior to the, um, I that? Prior to the creation of single police force, we had at least. Uh, some democratic oversight of policing with because we had regional police boards made up of elected local councillors who could scrutinise and challenge chief constable uh, chief constables I can't speak at all today chief <laughs> constables. So I mean this centralisation thing that we had um, uh, everything coming towards one single police uh, police Scotland organisation. Do you think that's been good or bad for the, the Scotland in general? I think one biggest problem is if previously, if one police um, region was to do something wrong, they could be investigated by a neighbouring region. We've sort of lost that ability. Right. I don't like uh-huh. that. I don't like the whole setup, the procedure where the person in charge of uh, ultimately responsible for the law in Scotland is on the cabinet of the government. That, that makes no sense to me whatsoever. So I think the way it's been set up, yes, 100%, the, 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 the vision would to be very much a police state. But I think the reality is you have three hoops to jump through before you get a police state, and that is the police have right. to end criminality. The prosecution service have to um, decide that they've got enough evidence to prosecute and put it to a court. And then a court of law has either got to decide through a judge or your peers, if it's a serious crime, that you, you are a criminal. And, and I think, but for the grace of God, the, 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 the checks and balances are at the right side of all cages now. I don't think it would take much to tip it over because there certainly is um, a lot of closeness between the government and the law. But mm-hmm. I think probably by poor chance as opposed to um, pure chance coincidence that we're, we're all right just now, but it's no, no far away. Yeah, it's. Um, I don't know. I mean, we saw that some someone pointed out here. You saw Count Dankula, um, who was arrested for the Nazi pug thing, and mm-hmm. uh, and he was, uh, you know, given a fine. And the punishment, to some extent, is the process. Right, knowing you're under investigation. For example, they investigated us. What would happen is they would, you know, take all our computers away. And then we're like, well, we can't speak, and so on. So, anyway, um, moving on. Uh, that was. Well, so- can I just make a oh, comment? Yeah. Because um, one of the things that I read today was that the police have come back and said that, you know, a lot of people have been saying that this is just such a waste of police time and it's going to cost a fortune. The police came back and said that, oh, it's had very minimal impact. But I think people are not buying this because how do you investigate 7,000 reports without it taking up a lot of time and a lot of manpower or women power, as the case may be? Right. Um, so, of course, it's going to cost money. And over a year's time, I mean, this could cost hundreds of thousands of pounds and the police are already stretched very, very thin. Right. OK. Um, yeah, definitely. I think that's that's part of it uh, uh, there anyway. So, Twitter thing. OK, next up. Are you a member of the far right? Well, certainly, Hamza Yusuf thinks so. But before all that, uh, if you have liked it, please like the show. Um, it's number one thing you can do to help us shoot up the algorithm and hit the subscribe button, which will glow. I've tested it, it glows when you say that. <laughs> so we'll be back in a second, talk more about Hamza Yusuf and the far right. Okay, right. Uh, where are we? Um, We're here. Yes, taking time <laughs> off, sending sending money to Gaza and trying to help his pals in Hamas get a ceasefire. Hamza Yusuf picked up, saying that anyone who objected to hate crime with law was far right. Now, these are here. 
the journalist wa- rambles on for a, a minute, first of all, but whatever. Did Where you cut it? that out? No, no, no you have to, nonetheless, you still have to listen to it. So here we go. Interestingly, you too have also been reported under the new hate crime legislation. And it actually, for many Scots who've reported you, goes back to a speech you made in 2020 where you went through a whole series of important senior public posts in Scotland which are held by white people. And you made a very powerful point about how white, 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 so many important positions in Scotland are. And you said it's not good enough. Now... Scotland is 96% white, and there are some very active people, particularly on social media, who are saying Hamza Yusuf's message was essentially racist. It was anti-white. And I, for one, feel that this is stirring up hatred against me as a white person. The police aren't interested. They say it's nonsense. They're certainly not going to investigate it. it. But, but, under the new legislation, the police also have to, as I understand it, record it as a non-criminal hate incident and you will be named. How do you feel about that? So a couple of points to make. Uh, the description of those who, who reference that speech as hatred, I've not seen anybody who has described it in that way that isn't frankly part of the far right. Oh, well, there we go. So if you disagree with Hums's white speech, then you're part of the far right. Apparently. Um, well, I don't know, because I think this is a typical tactic from people with weak brains. It's no different from calling someone a racist or a transphobe or a British nationalist. It's basically a type of, to my mind, a false moral equivalence that attempts to exaggerate an imaginary extremism that we are supposed to have and other people like us are supposed to have with their very real extremism to make them appear less dangerous. Um, walking, I mean, walk, wanting to break up the UK, it's an extreme position. And bringing in an authoritarian hate crime law is an extreme position. Yet he's trying to say that the people who are against that are far right. In fact, the, the people who, expo- who are against their extremism are the people in the middle. Right, that's why we call this thing the majority because it's people in the middle who are, who are, who are missed out by all this. These extremists on either side. So we reject it, 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 this type of extremism. What do, I mean, what do you think of this type of talk, uh, Craig? I, I just think it's another incorrect adjective to label someone when they don't agree with you in an attempt to silence opposing view. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean that's objective, isn't it? To silence. I mean, that, the whole thing seems to be about silencing folk, right? So you they make a hate crime law, and then they say, "All right, if you're against it, you're far right, so you should be silenced." It's like a, a, a you know a catch twenty two, you know, tautological yeah. argument. Basically, they're saying you it doesn't matter, so it doesn't matter what you do. You're a far right person, of course, you deserve to have your um, your speech impinged. But we're not. That's the thing. We're not. I often think about this in today's world. You know, it, it's not really about. Is it about right and left politics at the time, or is it really about moderates versus extremists? You know, because each person, to my mind, has many different political strands inside them. You know, you might say you're a Tory, but you know, you you'd still be you'd be happy with some socialist policies, for example, or some Labour policies, perhaps, right? But if you're if you just try to be an extremist all the time, you're never going to get your ideas out into the public realm because people are people, and they're not really most people aren't simply extremists, and maybe they can do a nudge with a nudge from time to time from extremists, but not. Not all the time, which has happened in Scotland, and then the extremists are actually saying, "Well, you're just an extremist as well." But we're not extremists. It's very, it's very annoying because these rea- the reality is that these extreme ideas don't seem to work. I mean, do you, it would, we've been talking, to Craig, about the the extremist greens, right? I mean, mm-hmm. they, they've they've they, they've taken over the, the the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish government, and they've put these extreme I- ideas out there. I mean, you, the, you, 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 it's. I mean, what do you think of that? I think the Greens are absolute fruitcakes. Um, and like the SNP, they're not a political party. They're an activist group that have suddenly right. became in power in our country. And I think when you realise that, you, you, you sort of work out why the country's in such a mess because one of them's controlled the country for 17 years and other mobs gave them a hand for about three of them. Um, mm. I know you're going to talk about it later, some of the absolute fruitcake ideas that the, the Greens um, get to put into um, acts because they were the kingmakers in this whole deal. If it wasn't for the Greens, the SNPs wouldn't have taken power after the last election. And um, 
it just it baffles me. It just shake your head. I mean, every day it just gets nuttier and nuttier and nuttier. And you did you think you've heard the worst yeah. of it? And then yeah. something you open up your phone tomorrow. I think we're under. I, I just feel that we're under assault by extremists, really. And yeah. then they point around, point around like, "Oh no, you're the extremist." You're like, "No, no, actually, we're not. You're an actual extremist, and you're imagining no, that you're extremists." It's absolute nonsense. Yeah, it's, it's like you, you know, being far right. Now, I don't even know what that means, right? I don't know how to measure it anymore. Um, but being far right translates to bad, right? Yes. But there's never anybody, you know, that you, um, society terms as far left. Now, if there was, probably Corbyn was about the closest to that in UK politics recently. But even that was still acceptable to some people. You know, like, who mm -hmm. writes the rules here? How does society yeah, decide that the word well, far right? Well, that's the point, is isn't it? They're, 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 they're making the rules, and then they're mm -hmm. trying to enforce the rules and trying to say that you're breaking the rules because you're the kind of person that would break the rules anyway. It's all mm -hmm. that, That's the problem. I think that's the, it leads to a kind of... It's definitely a kind of... Uh, tyranny, I think, in this yeah. in this case. And, of course, Hamza Yousaf, I mean, his, his uh, positions, I think, are... I mean, his own positions are extreme, giving money to um, Gaza um, when, when you know, when it's not necessary and against uh, um, his, uh, against government policy. And then there's all kinds of other nonsense he comes up with. So it's just yeah. like, but it's not just uh, Hamza Yusuf, it's the Greens and it's uh, so much extremism around. It seems very difficult for people to wade through it. Mary, well, you get any James, thoughts on it? Well, just James Jimison is saying the SNP are Marxist dressed as nationalist. So everything is right wing to them. Yeah, yeah. Well, they are to, I mean, yeah. it's a matter of perspective then, isn't it? Yes. If and you're I'm, so far over, then everything is right to the right. And I'm glad to see you around the right way again, Mary. There, you were kind of reversed before. Yeah, I, I twirled my head at like the ex, the exorcist. <laughs> right. You know? Okay. Very good. All right. So we'll see actually how this uh, plays out, and uh, this false moral equivalence plays out in action in a second because we'll back to talk about nationals getting a Labour candidate suspended for liking tweets. Uh, see you in a second. Right, we have loads of viewers all watching the show right now. Tons of comments coming in. Must be great Craig's influence um, on the show, and that is good. Well, of lots course. of people are wishing him well. So. Oh, that's very good. Isn't yeah, it? Uh, that's good. And we wish him in. well. well I think mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not the most technical person, but I do think I managed to get it going live in my own YouTube channel. So that might have oh, added really? three viewers. Well, that will help. Oh, that will I help. see a lot of people here. It says paired. So I think right. that must be people. Oh, that, yes. But David is typical. He says, "Good to see you on the majority show, Craig." There we go. That is great. Thank you. Well, David. it's quite good to it's quite okay. good to uh, talk to different people uh, across uh, uh, um, who uh, you know are fighting the fight, good fight as it were as well. Okay, so you. you might think that Scottish media would be the ones defending free speech in Scotland. Oh, foolish you! Today, the Scotsman's reporter, Connor Matchett, wrote a post condemning Labour's, Labour's candidate for Kirkcaldy. Okay, I can say that. Kirkcaldy. <laughs> Kirkcaldy Have you been County. chewing toffee, Mark? <laughs> ah, I tried some mouth exercise or something. <laughs> for Kirkcaldy and Cowden Beath, which is not that easy to say. That's true. Anyway, the lady's called Wilma Brown. Um, candidate Brown's crime was liking tweets. So how here's dare the she? thing. I mean, how dare she, right? Okay. Uh, now she's been suspended by the party pending an investigation. So I decided I would have a look at these different tweets and see oh. what they were all about. And uh, I encourage you to do the same, actually, and have a look and see are they really um, racist uh, and uh, and so on. Now, uh, what so what kind of tweets were they? First of all, she she liked a tweet saying that Hamza's white speech was racist. Well, it was racist. So there's no, <laughs> there's no, and if you want to arrest me for saying it's racist, go ahead. I don't care. Um, Elon Musk said it was racist. And most Scots think it's racist. So that's not unusual. So the next one was, she liked to tweet calling Hamza Hamas useless. Well, that's really, that's, she should be sent to the gulag for that straight away. I mean, not even saying, right, writing that he, Hamas useless, which we are saying right now, by the way. So, uh, and we agree with also um, that, but that she liked it, just liked it. And then she liked, oh, she bits is a big crime. She liked uh, tweets supporting J.K. Rowling, which. <laughs> 
<laughs> shocking. <laughs> it really is shocking. Right, so let's start at the beginning, uh, Craig. Was Hamza's white speech racist? I think the simple answer is uh, most definitely, uh, and it could also raise hatred. Um, mm -hmm. Can you imagine taking the floor in what is supposedly our centre of democracy and doing a similar speech highlighting positions of power such as Mayor of London, Brown, Prime Minister, Brown, Prime, uh, First Minister of Scotland, Brown, First Minister of Wales, Brown. You'd well, get arrested before you got to the line describing Hums' skin colour. <laughs> yes, probably. It's very true. You know, yep. Just spin it around. Is that racist? I, I think you would probably be found guilty before you get out the door. Yeah. Well, in, with the hate crime bill, uh, what Holmes Yousaf has said is basically it comes down to whether a, re a, pers a reasonable person would find, for example, the hate crime bill, whether they would find it yeah, offensive. Yeah, good luck finding or, a reasonable person in Scotland. So, <laughs> <laughs> so would a reasonable person think that that speech was racist? I think they would. Yes, I think so. And would, is it stirring up hatred? I think its intention um, may be perceived, certainly by some, to be stirring up hatred, and that certainly would be a hate crime uh, under the thing. Now, I will caveat this to some extent. Um, among these unconventional opinions, I did see one post where the candidate, uh, Miss Wilma Brown, uh, said that uh, she... Uh, that a British Indian man would never be British. Now, remember, she didn't say that. She liked that one, right? And that was actually the GP News contributor, post by the GB News contributor, whose name here is, I can't find right now, Am Aman Bogal. So we're left, basically, this is the, th I think this is the point here. We're left with one dodgy tweet. And not actually a tweet, and I'd like one to dodgy say that like. We don't really know what the context of that was. It may be something that, I mean, at face value, it does seem a bit racist. But what was the context? Well, the thing know. is, you can't tell from from a like. You can use a like for all kinds of, yeah, yeah. of reasons here. And it, but the thing is, see, are we really going to, to going to have a society where we judge people on the basis of one dodgy tweet? No, it's not a dodgy tweet. It's a dodgy like. Oh do, no, that's right. It's a dodgy like. Mm. Very good. You know. So this is the even. I mean, and also I think this applies even if the person isn't in your side. Right. I mean, I don't think anyone should be, you know, unfairly accused of being something or tried to be cancelled because of very flimsy evidence. And this, I suppose my point is, why are the newspapers doing this? Right. I mean, we have a situation where basically this has been brought to people's attention by nationalists. Right. Who basically and, and I read the thread of this. Well, OK, the okay. The, the, this Wilma is a racist, transphobe, blah, 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 and went on with this. Now, the newspaper should have had a look at that and gone, well, okay, well, maybe one of these posts might be an issue. But they just went full in. One of these likes should be an no, issue. Well, one of these likes. I, mean, I keep saying tweets as well. <laughs> right? So the, the simple answer, I think, though, is that the Scottish media is not our friend. And if they, they'll do anything to get like, likes for our power, and this is just an example here. If the place, if the police and the hate crime laws don't get you cancelled, then you can be sure that the Craven Scottish media will do their best to do the same. Meanwhile, Janie Godley gets a free pass. Well, <laughs> I, I I think that all you know tweets and posts and everything should be um, basically compared to the what I would now call the Janie Godley scale of of racism and abuse if I, if online, where she's you know a hundred. And then people can get compared against that. I would say that these likes are basically down in the single digits. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. I mean, so it seems to be one rule for them and one rule for, for you know, for other people. You know, them being whoever, you, whoever your opponents are. Craig, any thoughts on this one? Yeah, I think our society often follows America, um, and it seems a ridiculous can can cancel culture of the United States awokeness has started to influence the permanently offended within the United Kingdom of multicolored flags. And again, it's just a cultural copy of what's going on in America where you know people are getting cancelled for saying the truth in many uh, many times. And well, this is the thing about yeah. this, or, or just even, whether well, it's not even the truth, it's just getting cancelled for having an unconventional, not an unconventional, actually a conventional opinion. It's mm -hmm. it's an actually mm -hmm. unconventional to say that J.K. Rowling is a, is a transphobe. That's an extremist position. That's what extremists say. 
right? She's yeah. she's not a transphobe. She is uh, she is uh, sticking up for women's rights. She's not against trans people. So it's a different a different mm-hmm. thing altogether. And the same thing mm-hmm. is goes with uh, as we say we talk with the racist thing. I mean, most Scots would think that is racist. But what Hamza Yusuf said. So are we all now? Ex- you know, again, we are we are all lumped into the extremism box. Well, they get on with their actual extremism. Um, yeah. So now here's Jerry, just to give an example of this, how this works. Here's Jerry, I'm not a nationalist, Hassan. And he says, Labour have suspended their candidate for Cowdenbeath and Kirkcaldy at the forthcoming UK election, Wilma Brown, for racist and offensive comments. Actually, she didn't make racist and offensive comments. She just liked tweets. As well as that, a quick troll finds that they have liked comments suggesting they think the Scottish Parliament should be abolished. Oh, my God. And there is a tweet there from our co-host, Mark Zegfeld. (laughs) <laughs> now, <laughs> basically, you know, he's basically saying that, you know, that ask, just even suggesting that the, the, the Scottish Parliament should be abolished is almost a hate crime. And that case, <laughs> you're not case. wearing the T-shirt today, Mark. I'm not wearing the T-shirt today. And okay, it's a, a that's a different opinion. But I mean, it's just an opinion, isn't it? That's the thing. And they want to criminalise all our opinions, Craig. Yeah. Any thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Final thoughts on this? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but liking tweets will often offend me. And that's just how <laughs> yes. mad the world's become. You know, I, I like, you, I would say on an average day, I probably like about 200 tweets. And I don't pay that much attention to, I mean, I don't sit and think through everyone, like, how could this be used against me? Well, that's the thing, you shouldn't have to. And I like them for different reasons. Well, that's true. You like them, make you use them as a bookmark, or you might go, oh, yeah. that's quite interesting. I want to make a comment against that later. Or you might want to, you know, all kinds of things. Now, I'm not covering for the lady in that sense. I'm just talking in broad position. It might come out later that she is actually a racist and made racist comments. That's a different matter altogether. But judging on the evidence presented so far, it seems very, very slight. And uh, it seems like a manufactured outrage started with nationalists who had a grievance and then extended into a newspaper editor, newspaper journalists and editors who should know better. Mm. And, uh, and 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 uh, you know basically cancel this woman for very very minor flimsy reasons. flimsy premise. Yeah. Oh, yeah. How, how often how often like a tweet just out of common decency and courtesy? Yeah. If someone takes the time to respond to a tweet that I've put out, I think it's very nice just to click the like button. Yeah. It doesn't I, say I, I'm involved in it. It doesn't say I agree with it. It just sort of says oh. thanks very much, and I've noted that you've responded to my tweet. I don't yeah. realise I, I was like a lot. Sorry to interrupt you, Craig. There, I was just going to say I actually like a lot of tweets. I put like on a lot of tweets that I don't agree with. Right. So I mean, that's the defence. The defence is to say, look, I, you know, I like a lot of stuff, whatever it is. And by the way, J, uh, you know, J.K. Rowling isn't a transphobe, whatever it is. But the problem is the parties are so concerned with how things appear and so on that they they can't deal with that. We've seen what's happening with reform, for example. Instead of fighting back, they're kowtowing to uh, hope not. Um, I fear or whatever it's called. Mm. Anyway, and uh, but, and it just seems a kind of a, la- a lack of political maturity, perhaps. Mary, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I didn't know if you were finishing up there, but I've got a funny comment here. It says, if the SNP are so obsessed with J.K. Rowling, maybe the Scottish Parliament should be renamed Himza Yousaf and the Chamber of Secrets. <laughs> very, very, <laughs> very good. Yes, well, we hope that they will find, that she will the find all of... Uh, <laughs> we find all of Hamza Yousaf's horcruxes and get rid of them or mm-hmm. stab them or okay donation message it says it takes a lot of work to uh, organise the show or social media feeds and articles we simply wouldn't be able to do that without the help of all our lovely sponsors and that means many of you watching here if you can please do donate to keep uh, help keep the show going uh, you can put a super thanks or super sticker uh, in YouTube uh, which is uh, very easy, handy to do, or you can go to our website and as we blue button at the side of the page where you can uh, make a one monthly or one-time donation, whatever you can afford is most appreciated. Everything helps. Uh, very good. So uh, that'd be great. So thanks. Next up, Craig is going to be talking about his experience with um, trying to get information out of the Scottish government. So we'll see that you're back in a second. Right, we're getting close to record numbers again watching the show, so uh, thank you for that influence. Craig, you're going to be up and talking about your experiences. Tell us a little bit what happened. 
Yeah, well, I made a complaint about Humza's misuse of funds to the Ethical Standards Commissioner um, as their roles to investigate poor practice by MSPs. And I made the complaint mid-March. The, the, the automatic reply I got said it could take 45 months to um, what? And, and, and what was that complaint about? So, uh, it was about the um, misuse of funds when he sent the money to Gaza. The FOI I got that oh, went okay. into the Telegraph right. and blew up. Um, with that, I'd also asked them to tell me what um, fund it came from and justifying why it came from that fund. I actually knew the answer. Um, yeah. I knew where it came from. And they actually tried to suggest it went into the um, humanitarian um, fund, which it could have been used for. Unfortunately, humanitarian fund had been used up that year. So, you know, right. you could give you could give Gaza and the UNRWA money from that fund, but there was no money left in it. So they'd used the International Development Fund. Now, right. the criteria for that, they'll no bore you to death. There's four tests. You need to take one of them. It takes none of them. Gaza nor okay. the UNRWA. So right. I had made my complaint on that basis that it misused funds. Uh, came home, sorry, came home Monday night, email was there from the commissioner, and to my amazement, it advised me that as my complaint was regarding Humza's actions as a first minister and not as an MSP, they were un unable to take it further. Okay. They then advised Why? me that any... Sorry? Why? <laughs> well, Why well, yeah, okay. Let's go yeah, ahead. Yeah, yeah, stop cutting me off. You should be a professional at this. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, they advised me that any such complaint about first minister, a cabinet minister, or a whole, has a whole host of high-ranking um, civil servants was to be dealt with through the ministerial code complaints process. Okay? Right, okay. Because they're only allowed to investigate up to a certain level. Now, guess where I should direct such a complaint, Mark? I'm guessing you have to do it to the First Minister themselves? Well, am I surprised? Yes, I was advised by the Commissioner himself to direct my complaint to the Office of the First Minister. Right. Yeah. Now, what I'd like to say at this point, I had two quite long telephone calls with two people within the Ethical Standards uh, Commissioner's office, one of them being of the highest level without naming them. Got absolutely no gripe with them. Um, they were just delivering information about a dubious process. It wasn't their doing. But right. yes. that, that left me worried about two things. I'm not worried about two things, but it brought two things to the front of my mind, and that is two very recent instances where the ministerial code has been used. The first mm -hmm. time I can remember was Nicola Sturgeon lying, lying to, allegedly lying to Parliament about the Alex Salmon inquiry. Oh, yes. And, okay. she's, uh, and, and, and what, what I was led to believe was somebody in government that was looking at this set up an independent inquiry. Right. It now seems more logical to me that this independent inquiry must have been set up by Nicola. In the second uh, case, yes, the more recent that, case, isn't that true though? She she was, um, yeah, she invited uh, Hamilton, I think James Hamilton. Mm -hmm. I've got a, a clip a thing here. Yeah, Hamilton to um, to come in. It was her. Yeah, it was actually different. I think it was done through the, the office of the first minister. Yeah, and the most recent case that's been looked at through a ministerial code will be Matheson. And bizarrely, right. when you consider that this whole process was in place and it must have been a complaint that's went into. Hamza Yousaf's office, Hamza Yousaf, while the process was taking place, was asked, should Michael Matheson be sacked for this? And he said, before a decision was made, no, because he's a nice guy. Yeah, now, what I would suggest, if that's not prejudice in an outcome, what is? It is a totally bizarre situation where the First Minister marks the First Minister's homework. Well, is it any really surprise? I mean, when he set this parliament up, I mean, did they not even think of, of that thing here? How can we, how can we, uh, you know, who will watch the watchers as the expression goes, you know? Um, did they never think who's going to do that? They never actually okay. ever made anything that would say the UK Parliament should step in at this point, yeah. which is actually what should really happen, right? If, a, yeah. if someone has committed such a, an egregious uh, uh, act as try, try to steal £11,000 off of the taxpayers, that should just be straight up. That goes yeah. to that goes to UK committee or something like that, or the UK police even, and gets yeah. out of the Scottish yeah. Government's hands. Go ahead. One, one, one aspect to this I forgot to mention. In 2018, Nicola Sturgeon, I couldn't remember it 
this happening. But once I read up and I went, God, I remember her taking to the stage and telling us how wonderful again she was. The, the, the how many times is that? <laughs> uh, it was quite often. <laughs> and the policy was changed by her in 2018. And you can find a right. press release about it. It's full of the... If you play the SMP buzzword bingo, you would get a full house in the first two paragraphs. Mm. It was all this transparency, openness. We're going to be the best government in the history of governments. And as we prepare oh, yes. an independent country, we must have this wonderful process. So, we're, you know, we're updating the ministerial code. Now, I am unsure right now if pre-2018 the process was to report it to the First Minister. Now, if it was already, you reported it to the First Minister. That does not mean Nicola Sturgeon's a saint. What that means is Nicola Sturgeon had an opportunity to do what she's saying and make this fantastic process and have a third party arm's length sure. organisation look after it. And she failed to do so. But I don't know if pre-2018 there was a different process. If there was a different process and it is now you write to the First Minister, it is even worse than right. the alternative. But both, both <laughs> there's not there's not a winning option here for them. Yes, you know. Yeah, I mean, this is I mean, this is the thing we've been talking about a long time. This this lack of checks and balances, and and they've been allowed to, as many of the comments are mentioning, uh, they mark their own homework for too far too long. This whole idea mm -hmm. of devolve and forget was a disaster. It basically allowed mm -hmm. them to get away with whatever they wanted to and make up their own rules to suit themselves. And we don't mm -hmm. even know half of the corruption that's, that has that has been done yet, um, because they're still in power. And once mm -hmm. they're not in power, then maybe there might be a chance of uncovering some of it. But I don't very much doubt that Labour will want to go over much of it. You know, it's just a can <laughs> of worms. Anyway, yeah, I doubt, if they, I doubt many Labour parties. Yeah, I doubt many parties would want to lift the bonnet and find out what's under there because I'm not a fan of any of them. To be perfectly honest yeah, with you, so don't you know, yeah, I, I, mean, I think that, problems. Yeah, I just think that there's not going to be anybody worse than the SNP. So well, you know. Well, that's true. And one thing, you know, we'll say for, um, you, you, there, there's just not, no, there's nothing from, you know, the Tories, for example, will say, look, we want to, we want to make this better. Mm -hmm. I, right. All we're hearing is, this is great. This is a great parliament and all this. And you're like, no, it's not. It's obviously not. Clearly not. But mm -hmm. you're not putting any suggestions to improve it. Instead, instead, you're just saying it's good and not saying how it could be improved because I think they don't want to fundamentally say that it's a flawed proposition because once they start discussing that it's a flawed proposition, perhaps the whole thing breaks yeah. down. And, it's, I and mean, then people just, say, I that's the end of yeah. it. Can I give you another, just something that came to my head there? Yeah, go ahead. This would be bonkers, right? But it, it would be some buzz. When you take your oath at the next parliament in two years' time and all these new MSPs get sworn in, you must also swear that in the next five years you will never blame Westminster, Brexit, Tories <laughs> or uh, Labour and just actually get on we govern the country with this book of rules that we've got yes. at our disposal because I think that's been the biggest problem for Scotland in the last 17 years. Well, I think, yeah, nationalism is deflection. So, I mean, that's the problem with it. The best way to get rid of this culture of deflection is to get rid of the nationalists. Well, get rid of the SNP, first of all, and then nationalism mm -hmm. after that. And I'm going to talk about that a bit later on. Very good. Um, anyway, so what do, you, what do you think you're going to be able to get some resolution to this in any time well, soon? I've now, a, I've now got a decision to make. I either write to Humza or I complain about Humza. But that, you know, I, I can't, you know, it's taught not to do stupid things as a child. And, you know, common sense and logic would suggest yeah. I already know how that's can, going to... Can you investigate yourself, Humza, please? Yes. <laughs> yes. And and agree with the guy who you... When, remember the day his tirade of tweets when the, after the Telegraph? He actually described mm -hmm. me without describing, mentioning my name. And he said, whoever gave this stuff to the newspapers are Islamophobic conspiracy theorist. So he ain't oh, going yes, to agree with me, that. is he? Yeah, well, you're, par you're probably one of these far-right people we keep hearing about as well. Um, but I'm sure you're on the list. On a list somewhere and committing non-crime hate instance as we mm. speak. Anyway, great. That was very good. I hope you do get... Well, we'll have to figure out. We'll keep following you and see how that goes. Next up, Mary is going to do a roundup of the week's news. So please keep those comments coming up and hit that like button. We love the likes as we're back in a second. Okay, so let's just well, before have... Before you start, I just oh. wanted to say a wee thing that I think Craig is doing really well on his first appearance on the show. So thank you very much for, for doing that. Um, thank really you, really Craig. Happy. 
Right, Mary, now you can go on with it. Thank you. <laughs> well, let's have a look at a few of the headlines from this week. Right, yay. First, first of all, <laughs> let's have a look at the new YouGov poll, which came out today showing Labour ahead of SNP in Scotland for the first time since the independence referendum. So this um, was based on Westminster voting intention, uh, where one in three Scots, which is 33%, currently said they intend to vote for Labour at the upcoming general election, giving Labour a minor two-point lead over the SNP, who are on 31%. That means that the SNP have lost a fifth of their 2019 voters to Labour, but they're still holding on to 66% of those who backed them previously, Jeez. which I still find really quite <laughs> surprising. Um, How is that even possible? I know. I mean, who's, who is still voting for the SNP? It's hard to believe. Uh, the Conservative vote share in Scotland has shifted more noticeably, falling six points since October to 14%. Um, so the Tories overall have lost 19% to Labour and 22% to Reform UK. Oh, OK. And we need to keep an eye on that. Uh, sure. Lib Dems on 7% and the Greens are on 5%. What do you think of this, guys? Well, of course, it's, it's a momentum, isn't it? I often say that the SNP is a momentum party. When people think that it can achieve its main goal of independence, they're more likely to vote for it. When it gets that goal disappears, which has happened, mm -hmm. the less people vote for it, the less people will vote for it. And that's going to get even worse as time goes on because people are going to have to make the choice. Are they going to, oh, sorry, non Tory voters? Um, are going to have to make a choice. Are they going to continue with the dead end of SNP um, nationalism or are they going to be part of Labour's brave new world for what that's worth? Um, so it's just going to decline more. And after the general election, it's going to see it's going to uh, yeah. it's going to be quite awful for them. And I'm quite looking forward to that because you know, considering the amount of smug um, comments we get that on on Twitter, that people are like, uh, "Yeah, we're going to win. We're at fifty percent in the polls and all this nonsense," and it's just delu so delusional. And Craig, I, I, I listen. I, the two things about this story, I, the, the biggest. Um, stat that I took out of it was this 20% swing from SNP to Labour. And that, that'll probably be just returning voters that have went yes. to vote to SNP chasing uh, independence. But if you look at the majority, and I had a wee look about some of the closer seats, and if you take 20% of the people voting SNP out of the constituency and flung it in Labour, they're losing, excuse my language, a shitload of seats. Mm -hmm. So there was a poll done about a month ago by the same uh, YouGov, and it's uh, 18,000, 19,000 people they polled um, in a UK-wide one, and they, they modified the results to, you know, to suit the, the peculiarity of the SNP because they don't compete all the seats. And it suggested that they were going to lose like 29 of their seats, and they would get to about 19 or some crazy figure. And people were up in their arms about it, um, obviously the nationalists, and I thought it was maybe over-exaggerating slightly, but now when you see this information with the 20% shift, I actually think it's <laughs> probably not that far out. And the other mm. thing you've got to factor in when you when you look at any polls, because the Nats tend to jump on some that say, yeah, I've heard, you know, this poll shows us 51%, and those pro-SMP, pro-Indy ones tend to be published by Ipsos. Mm, and I've done a video course. last month or the month before which showed you that Ipsos uh, are a customer, sorry, a customer of Ipsos is the Scottish government. Yeah, of course. Yeah, five yeah. million pounds or something like that, right? Correct. And I looked into some of the comments that the chairman of that company made. Oh, I know. To a woman that moved up to London, and she said that her business is to keep happy customers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tangled with uh, the big boss, the global boss of Ipsos, and I was saying, "What are you doing with here? This is what is this about? Your results? I, you know, mm. I noticed it quite early on, and I, I made a, I, 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 I sorted all the things, all the independence results, polling results, and at the top, it's all Ipsos." And you're like, well, how is it possible that you're the only ones that have ever given over 50% to support to the SNP? And then a few weeks later, it came out, yeah, they've, they're being paid for, for it, really. Yeah. Mary, but no, next news. Um, the next headline I had was the late and over-budget Calmac ferry, Glen Rossa, finally launched on the Clyde. Oh, yes. Uh, it was launched on Tuesday. Uh, it's known as Hull 802. 
Um, and it was launched down at Ferguson Marine, as you would expect. Now, the thing about this is it's been nine years from order to, <laughs> to just getting it onto the water. It's been seven years since the sister vessel, the Glen Sanox, was launched on the water, and it still hasn't entered service. So right. God knows when this one will ever enter service. It's cost four times more than the agreed price, and basically it's a dual fuel ship, and there are no bunker facilities ready for the fuel for these boats. Right, and the cost of this, if you work it out, is basically a one million pounds per job. That's the cost to the taxpayer. Well, that's not actually. I was thinking about that. It's not so bad if you divide it by ten years. It's a hundred thousand pounds a person a year, but it shouldn't be taking ten years to make a ferry. And paying a hundred thousand pounds per person. I mean, that's that's all was, people. Anyway. I was in the uh, the motor trade for twenty five years of my life, and. If these boats were motor cars, they needed seven MOTs before they were even used, which I find absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. Uh, it's, absolutely it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Right. I mean, that's it. It's managed to get to the water, so God knows when it'll ever actually get into service. Another um, transport uh, themed headline this week was that the, and this doesn't come as any surprise, I don't think, the number of Scots cycling remains static despite investment in infrastructure so what we're talking here is about all those bloody bike lanes that are everywhere <laughs> and the hundreds of millions of pounds that are being spent on them and the new figures from cycling scotland's research shows the number of people using bikes is not increasing despite the huge expenditure the number of people using bikes for commuting has stayed the same for three years and bike ownership has actually fallen since 2017 Really? Back then, 43% of people said they had access to a bike, and now it's only 37%. So we're actually going backwards. We're pedaling backwards, people. <laughs> very, very good. Well, it's not an nonsense anyway. I was We were talking about this in the car earlier. And the, you know, the idea normally is that there's a demand for something, and then you build it. <laughs> this is not the normal way things work. Not we'll build these great bike lanes, and then lots of people will go out and buy bikes for some reason that's well, that's obviously not going to work and can combine that with the fact that it's been raining for the past six months with maybe one or two uh, days of sunshine and you're like come on really uh, it's just nonsense so they've spent hundreds of millions it's actually literally hundreds of millions on this in glasgow and other cities all green priorities that should actually that money should have gone into teachers and so on and of course it annoys motorists to sit there in a line in a single lane road now and they're like oh with and, and see the non bikes going by it's ridiculous. <laughs> well i think the or, snp's mantra has been build it and they will come well they did that's what they <laughs> but did. they haven't come <laughs> I think if Patrick Harvey didn't ride a bike every day, we probably wouldn't see half the expenditure. Um, yes. And the, the thing that gets me is not so much the bike lanes annoy me, particularly when you're stuck in traffic and there's a whole bike lane and a road that used to have two lanes and you're now down to one and there's no bugger in it. My, my girlfriend stays in the north of the city and the, during the, um, I'm sure if it was Commonwealth Games or the you know the World Cycling Championships, but for one of these, they built a BMX track up near Scotston. And what they tried to do was have bike lanes going into this thing. So there was a road that had four lanes previously. It's now got mm -hmm. two, one going up, one coming down, and two massive bike lanes that are almost as, as wide as a as a car lane. And, and I must go down that road three, four times a week. I have never mm -hmm. seen a single cyclist on it. But oh. the um, I've got a thing with cyclists. I, cyclists demand to be um, regarded as road users, which that's an acceptable request i don't i don't mind that uh, for their own safety far nothing else but the thing that really grates for me is you get to a set of traffic lights and they suddenly become pedestrians because they don't want to sit in the red mm. light and the rest sure jump on the pavements and stuff and i just go absolutely bonkers at them and it's a it's probably an insane and, and unrealistic hate that i've got no <laughs> for I know some people well, it's just entitlement. There's an entitlement culturally. It's like these bike lanes are more important than our kids' education, you know, like our, our swimming pools or our libraries. Lanes, it's like it's, and they're are. unused there. And the same for us in London Road, we've got there. Yeah, I've seen two people on it in two years, something like that. Yeah. It's absolutely it's, it's, not nonsense. And cyclist yeah. rights are more important than the alloy wheels in my car. Mm. Because I play Russian roulette every time I drive the streets of Glasgow that oh, I might need a new alloy yeah. wheel and a tyre. Because yes. of potholes, yeah. Um, I don't see any potholes in bike lanes. Yeah. Well, we should make, we should go out and make some just to annoy them. <laughs> well, that'd be good, wouldn't it? Uh, but well, then actually, we would never go into them because nobody bloody cycles on them, so it's a waste of time. Just... Right, we've got him started now. He's on a roll. <laughs> but, but bike lanes <laughs> actually 
They're full of trash because the, the cleaners can't get into the bike lanes. Well, what annoys me about them, seeing as we're on the topic, is <laughs> that they put the, the bus stop, they don't put it inside the bike lane, they put it out onto the road. So it means that if there's a bus there, the whole road stops mm -hmm. and you're stuck behind a, a bus. And instead mm -hmm. of putting into a lay-by that would be in the bus lane, in, in the bike lane, whereas the bikes are there just like, oh, yeah, we'll just go along. Well, you can... You know, a bike can easily go around a bus on the other side, but a car can't go around a bus when you've only got, you know, two lanes in the road. It, I don't know. It just, oh, it's absolute nonsense. It really is. Mary, any other news for us? Uh, no, that was it. That right. was my roundup. Yeah, it was very good, I thought. It was good, good chat there and got Craig opening up on his hatred of the, the two-wheeled... Um, you want my motions all going there? Mary, don't do that again. <laughs> he's, all up to high, he's all up to high, don't <laughs> <That's>, Right. Very <laughs> right. good. Okay, right. Next, where are we at? What have we got? Okay, this will... Um, things you can do to support the show. Uh, you can make a donation to the majority's 2024 crowdfunder. And some I did notice someone earlier put in a super thanks. Thank you very much to that person. Um, that's great. We really appreciate it. Of course, you can also go to a website and put a donation in there. You can also buy a T-shirt and a mug. Look at these beautiful majority T-shirts in a variety of colours and sizes as well. You can subscribe to the show on YouTube. You can also... Um, tell your friends about us, which is the number one thing you can do. And you can like, hit that like button now. We like the like button. And you can also do all of the above, which makes us feel really loved. Underline exclamation mark. And I put that bit in myself. Okay, coming up. It's the moment you've all been waiting for. The highlight of the week. It is Zoomer of the Week. You're supposed to say yay, maybe. Yay, oh, say sorry. Yay. Right, okay. <laughs> Right, so we have another record-breaking show. Thank you for being with us all this time. This week's Zoomer. Since the time of cavemen, people have used wood to... I'm back a bit there, Mark. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm just trying to get some context here. Okay, okay. People have used wood to heat their homes, chop a tree down, burn it to stay warm, and grow another tree and repeat. And who doesn't love sitting by the fire drinking a whiskey after a long day of fighting with nationalists on Twitter? But no longer. From April the 1st, new homes in Scotland will not, new built homes in Scotland, will not be allowed to use direct emission heating systems such as oil and gas boilers, bioenergy sources, which includes wood and log burning stoves. The Scottish government says heating homes can use about a fifth of Scotland's carbon emissions and needs to be tackled. Does it really? <laughs> this is the question. Does it really need to be tackled? Do we really need to be a world leader in uh, emissions or lack of them? No. We do not. New properties will need to use climate-friendly alternatives, such as heat pumps or heat networks. And it says here, cue Mary moaning about heat pumps. <laughs> you know, you should just record me moaning about heat pumps and then we can use it every time this comes up. <laughs> uh, having lived in Asia for 18 years in Japan, I can tell you that heat pumps are ugly, big, noisy things that give out, if you're anywhere near them, they give out a lot of noise, yeah, a lot of heat. Fumes and fumes and they're horrible and if you've got these in your presumably your back garden because most people i don't think are going to put them out the front you'll never be able to sit quietly in your garden again I oh that's tell actually you. that's very true we had two in florida and mm. they'd racket those things oh made. god they're noisy oh my god. we had them away around the side of the back of the building um so yeah, it wasn't so bad but i mean they're huge they need tons of maintenance all the time okay very good Ran over thank you okay continuing it says in the BBC, log burners are often viewed as a more sustainable heating method because they do not rely on fossil fuels such as oil or coal. In fact, in fact, there's a whole uh, industry of pulping trees, calling it biomass, and burning it in power stations like Drax, which is stealing taxpayers' money uh, hand over fist. But anyway, that's a different story. However, they say that using a stove or an open fire at home is a major contributor of a pollutant called fine particulate matter, which can cause damage to lungs and other organs. Perhaps if you're on the roof inhaling directly from the chimney. But, you know, the whole point of a chimney is it puts it away up there and it goes away. Absolute nonsense. This is the thing. They can never be satisfied. They say, get an electric car because we don't want any fossil fuels anymore. And then they get the electric car and they say, oh, but what about tyre particulates? They're even worse. You're like, I've never even heard of that before in my life. <laughs> Absolute nonsense. It doesn't keep me awake at night, I'll say that. Anyway, Tartan Tory, uh, Kate Forbes, said that rules may impact many living in her constituency. Yeah, well, that's sky. I mean, you know, it's full of folk with wog burners. 
and she said she was seeking urgent clarification on the new regulations uh, that her own party put in place. <laughs> You know, she's concerned for older residents who rely on them during a time of crippling energy price rises. Meanwhile, China continues to build one coal fired power station every week. They contribute 30% of global emissions. Scotland produces 0.1%. Scottish government said wood burners can still be installed in new homes where the need can be justified. Oh, so good luck need, with that. So you need a permit to get a fire in your house. <laughs> so for their ability to take the life out of absolutely everything, the enjoyment out of any anything, the, in the name of progress, our Zoomers are the Scottish government and the Greens, who extremist Greens who are behind them. Mm. That's me. Any basic thoughts on that? No, you don't need to. So if you don't want to, we can move on. <laughs> oh, well, my basic thought on that would be that um, I think house building is just going to come to a stop in Scotland. Oh, that's a very good point. Much. <laughs> um, yeah. Because, uh, you know, these heat pumps are really expensive. The other um, problem with them is that there's a lack of supply. Uh, so even if there are house builders willing to build houses, they're not. There's they won't be able to get hold of the heat pumps. So unless you're a person who's willing to move into your new built house with no heating, and you're not allowed to burn anything. Well, there was that news today that uh, so many uh, uh, companies were just decided not to build houses in Scotland before, yeah. primarily because of the rental situation. But yeah. uh, anyway, uh, Craig, you've got to go up next. Just okay. oh, go ahead. Aye, just on, on your point, I think we've got a housing crisis as it is, and we're now making it more difficult for house builders to build houses and justify building them. It's, it's completely bonkers. Oh, it's, so it's, it's, I know, it's, it's a housing crisis that, that they've made, I mm -hmm. think, in many cases. Craig, you'll be up in a second. Mm -hmm. Right, here you go. Okay, what's your Zimmer then? Right, well... Hamza Yusuf. Oops, oh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good that's one. Based, aye, it's based on a number of factors, but the most important one is I might never again have the privilege of nominating a Zoomer of the Week for the majority show, so I couldn't you know, miss the opportunity to be perfectly honest with you. <laughs> no, William, um, I think you can come back. You've, you've, you've passed the audition. Aye. <laughs> well, if Dave's never sick again and... and uh, uh, yes, Mark. Mark. Uh, well, we could maybe rotate Mark you, all three of you. Okay. We'll, we'll talk to you afterwards. Talk to you, um, <laughs> talk to you about that. <laughs> This week, it's seen them flip flop on people making complaints about hate crime. Pre launch, we were all to make complaints when we witnessed any hate, but three days later, he was suggesting that we should consider before we actually um, make a complaint. Um, and he trumped up, be this was a belter, right? He trumped up, be complaining his family drive through a council estate every day and they That's were saddened so much by this homophobic cafe because oh. this house estate is, you know, I think if they. <laughs> you may want to edit this out for your show, but it might be a run that his brother-in-law would make. I can't see uh, him having to make that route through the, the lovely town that he lives in. Um, but he taught that. He now claims something that you spoke about earlier, that anybody that complained about his white, white speech was part of the far right. Yes. Now, if that's not the work of a Champions League level Zoomer of the Week, I don't know what is. So I rest my <laughs> future on. He's a, a very strong contender. We don't yes. usually have Humsey Yusuf on as a contender, to be honest, actually. No, God, we I'll did have in the past. Time invite me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. He's, a most, he's an imbecile, a, a total imbecile, absolutely the stupidest man in whole of Scotland. And it's a credit to Scots <laughs> that they managed to get the stupidest man in Scotland to be the first minister. How is that even possible? Right. Craig's right. already got all, uh, some votes oh, coming in votes there. Coming. Public, yeah. public votes coming in. Mary, but hope, uh, you, I'll anyway. try my best, but I don't. I can't really be. I mean, <laughs> nobody can beat him, so really. Can right, I? so you're up anyway. Okay, right. Okay, so my Zoomer of the week is Jim Sillers, the former Labour MP who defected to the SNP back in the 80s. Oh, it's a long time. Who basically seems to be wise enough to realise that the SNP are never going to deliver independence, but he's still <laughs> deluded enough to think that setting up a national organisation, bringing together the 10 or so pro-independence bodies, he somehow thinks that they will be able to deliver independence. Um so uh, people who know Jim Sillers will know that he was married to Margot MacDonald. He was the SNP MP for Glasgow Govan. Um, but in the, if you remember in the 2021, in the run-up to the 2021 Holyrood election, he was backing Alex Salmon's Alba party. Right. Even though he's a member of the SNP, but he said he hadn't voted for the SNP for years. So it seems like the guy's all over the place. I'm not sure. Um, 
so he's saying that the Scottish, the current Scottish government is an embarrassment uh, to Scotland's right working class. So he is right about that. That's what I mean. He's, he's, he's so on point in a lot of things. So he's trying to establish this national organisation um, and he wants them to formulate a detailed strategy for achieving independence. He says these organisations are doing the work in formulating ideas that the SNP have neglected uh, and they should take the, take the lead in the yes movement. Uh, but he had some good comments, actually. He says, um, he says <laughs> this is just him talking about the SNP. He says, my party is mired in stupidity. <laughs> if we become independent, we, meet, we must reconstruct the Scottish economy. That's a big if. This is a good one. The baby box doesn't comp compare with the need for a house. Okay. So there's a few things that we have to, you know, agree with uh, Jim on. He says that 250,000 people wait, are waiting basically for housing associations or the local authorities to give them a house. Um, so he's, I'm, I'm just trying to get through this quickly here. He's basically, he's got a lot of good things to say about, well, from our side, there's a, good, a lot of good things to say about the SNP. And then he's going on about China and Vietnam and how they've basically um, struggling to develop. But now... He says, but we're stressing the importance of pronouns to our children and we have teachers who are fearful of saying the wrong thing. The stupidity we are now engaged in is unbelievable and the damage will be enormous. So Jim, I mean, he's so right about so many things, about the current state of Scotland and about how the SNP have failed Scotland and the independence movement. That It's hard to understand why he can't see that socialism and more so nationalism are the reason Scotland's in the mess it's in. Well, certainly nationalism is, is is the big issue. We talk about this all the time. I mean, they built the fire, and now they're like, oh, why is the house burned down? Yeah. And then they're still holding the matches. I know. They're like, come on, come on. Just, can you not just see it? Your, your own nationalism is the cause of your own misfortune. It's not that complicated. Right? Because I don't know that I think they just they just can't give up on that idea. They think they think somehow that they would be bad people or that somehow they would have failed or something like that. It's okay. Admit failure. It's if it is a failure, it's all around you. The house is burned down. Mm -hmm. It's not a crime. It's not a problem to say that yeah, okay. Sorry. And oh, the matches. Oh, okay. Wait, it's just Move on. St still doesn't get that independence would just make everything infinitely worse. So that's why Jim Sellers is my Zimmer of Week. Oh, yeah, any of you oh. say Craig about these deluded people, deluded nationals, how are they going? Nah, listen, I'm, uh, uh, no, because I'm not going to. I'm not actually going to pitch your 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 nomination for your house, that. Huh? And I'm really <laughs> disappointed that you never told me the rules because you had these slides and everything coming up for your nomination, oh, and that's pretty oh, disrespectful. Oh, let me know I can do that. Well, I don't, oh, I've got a slide. For, oh, oh, I don't have a slide for you yours because everyone knows Hums is. I actually looked up. Yeah, but I couldn't. There were so many. I just couldn't put them up. Anyway. As soon as you say Hums are yourself, you're going to win. So I mean, right. I think like... the public's with you anyway. But nonetheless, you have to decide, and you are allowed to decide your own. It's okay. as we often do. Mary did last week. Right. So, okay. Right. Well, I'm I'm going to um, reject my own nomination based on common courtesy. Oh. Okay. Oh, you don't need to. I'm also no, going no, to reject. Do no, I can't do that. I'm a nice guy. <laughs> right. Right. I, I get value. I have value. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, All right. I respect folk invite me into their home, and this is your cyber home. So I do appreciate that. So on, on that basis, and to be honest with you, I think you should maybe do an annual award ceremony and. Oh, yes, the the yes. Zoomer of the decade, Zoomer of the yes, millennium. Of um, <laughs> anyway, I'm going to reject my nomination just based on common courtesy. Also, going to reject Mr. Sellers for a similar basis of common courtesy on the fact that he's right old, right? And um, he's undoubtedly shown signs of his old age. Um, <laughs> and it also, we need to remind ourselves that being old is a protected group. Oh, so I'm in fear of being arrested if I nominate him to So, whoever oh, decided right. to ban the good old fashioned wood burning stove <laughs> is this week's guest host, I mean, how Zoomer is that? of the Week. How's Mark that? finally wins. Yes. Yay! Oh, I win, I win. I win. Very happy. Well done, Craig. Yeah. Unexpected, actually. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't expect that. I, I didn't, didn't expect see that, that coming, to be honest. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, you, you, your conversation with me, no vote to myself. I'm scared to get an old geezer, so take it. You know. <laughs> right. We'll take the win. You're, uh, you're too anyway. nice for this game, Craig. Too nice. <laughs> yes, wait till he's on next time. It'll be all the knives will be out. <laughs> it's okay. dog eat dog around here. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Okay, well, we're so happy to have you all with us on the show every week. It's Scotland's number one politics chat. My thought for the week is uh, recent polls, of course, 
are uh, encouraging and while they are welcome we need to be careful not to be complacent we may deal a strong blow to the SNP in this upcoming election but there's still a long way to go to eliminate Scottish nationalism and there's an even longer way to go to eliminate the psychology behind that can we do that perhaps but at least we can try uh, a huge thank you to Craig uh, Houston for coming onto the show please do subscribe to his channel um, thank you to all the people who came on to the show from uh, Craig's channel. Uh, we uh, we hope you liked uh, what you saw. Please subscribe to us as well. And someone's uh, asking when is the next one? The show is every Wednesday night at 7pm. Right, great. So uh, that's great. So thank you very much for all your support. This is another record-breaking show from the majority, uh, for the for majority, and we will see you again next week. Thank you and good night. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Thank you for the comments. Good night. Thanks for tuning in and thanks for the invite. Welcome.